Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Connor Fadgen. I'm Bampton Ireland's National Governance Officer. I'm joined tonight with Faye Andrews, our Membership and Development Manager, and Laura Now, our Membership Officer. So uh, you're all very welcome to this evening's Club Forum. Uh, this is our, our fourth forum, and it is being recorded just so we can uh, refer back to it for later on for, for anyone who has missed out. So uh, you're very welcome. The format for this evening's uh, for this evening's uh, club forum. Uh, I will be looking at the COVID-19 part of Return to Play. Um, and Faith then will be looking in terms of the member organization supports. And Lauren then will take us through the Blockworks app. And throughout the presentation, there is the Q&A box at the bottom of the, uh, the bottom of the um, at the bottom of Zoom. And if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in there and we'll do uh, an overall recap on those questions. Uh, myself and Fiat will probably try and answer them as we're going through, um, but we'll also uh, do a recap of them as well. Uh, so just for anyone who, who isn't keeping track of any questions that are coming in. Uh, so that's the, that's the format. So we'll get cracking on it. Um, so, this is what the current framework for the plan for living with COVID looks like in terms of badminton. Unfortunately, uh, we are at level um, five at the moment. Um, so for another couple of weeks yet. Um, so there's uh, not exactly a whole lot of activity activity happening. Um, in terms of this overall plan, we are waiting clarification on a number, number of items um, from Sport Ireland and their expert group. Um, and I know it has been highlighted already, uh, even in government buildings, about um, the lack of representation from other sports. And that has been highlighted on the expert group. Um, so, uh, look, in due course, we should have more information on that. In terms of events, unfortunately, uh, until we get to level two, uh, it's unlikely that we'll be able to run any events as, as it is at present. Um, but I suppose just, just taking that into consideration as well, you know, um, we, we understand that uh, counties, leagues had been running events and have been doing a really good job of it. So, uh, look, uh, again, we hope to have further clarification, uh, particularly in terms of events and club training uh, and the coaching side of things as well. So uh, when that becomes available to us, we'll be in a position to pass that on to everyone. So. Uh, just bear with me here now. Okay, so looking in terms of the, the challenges that we have in terms of COVID, uh, a lot of this is stemming from obviously the communications that we've had, um, particularly uh, the work that some of the work that FIG has done, and also just directly in terms of the club uh, COVID situation where uh, people were looking in, looking for information on guidelines, what the troubles were that they were having. Uh, so these are, I suppose, the, the key themes that have come out of uh, all of our communications was uh, the challenges in terms of recruiting volunteers, retaining membership, finance and costs, venue access, obviously look at the uncertainty, um, and as well as that competitions. So at this moment in time, obviously, look, there's not a whole lot of action going ahead. So it's a time to take a breather and also to prepare our clubs and prepare ourselves for coming back as stronger bodies within badminton. So uh, in terms of venue access, it's a case of reviewing uh, the type of venue that you're using, the number of courts that you need and your membership numbers. Um, in terms of the uncertainty, there's not really a hope we can do at present. It's difficult to predict, uh, but we are here to support affiliated bodies. All of our staff are, um, are available. Um, we're here to help you in getting your club, uh, get ready for for getting back up and, and going. So it's, it's important that when we do get back up and running um, that uh, we come back stronger. That's, that's the key theme of tonight, that it's not a case that we simply go back to doing things the way they were, because that may not be possible for a while, uh, depending on which level we, we do come back in uh, post Christmas. Um, but again, it's just a case of making sure that um, if there's a club development plan that needs to be done, that we have it done, um, that we also have an idea in terms of where we want our club to progress to. In terms of competitions and leagues, it is a fluid situation. And we do have event procedures available as well. So they're, they're on the BI website uh, under the COVID-19 resources. 
So in, in the event that events are allow, allowed to go ahead, it's important that we adhere to those. And I know clubs, uh, clubs, counties and leagues have been doing so uh, in the lead up to, to lockdown when it, was, uh, when it was possible to run events. In terms of volunteers, again, um, look, massive pressure, particularly in terms of COVID-19 officers. And I totally understand that. Um, it, it was a requirement for us to have these positions in place simply from an insurance perspective and also um, just making sure in, 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 I suppose, in terms of public health guidance, this is what we were given by, by Sport Ireland, the requirement for these. So it's um, it was essentially down to us to provide training, etc. Um, but at the end of the day, it does fall onto the clubs to make sure that they have those those uh, roles filled. But also in terms of volunteers for other things such as coaching, supervision of juveniles, uh, we have to look at ways in which we can try and get more people involved. There is a number of initiatives that BI are, are running and planning to run over the next while, which will hopefully try and bridge the gap to get more people involved and more people qualified. Um, so it's important that, that clubs utilise those and make full advantage of them. In terms of membership, again, it refers back to your venue access, assessing your membership, what you're currently able to able to have within your club, what capacity do you have, and that'll link directly as well with your volunteers. How many volunteers do you need then to, to manage that? In the lead up to um to the different levels coming into play, we had found that there was actually more people coming back to play badminton, and um, there was a, a range of new membership. We also seen that um, the Physical Education Association of Ireland, they had uh, granted that badminton was a green sport for them in terms of there actually being very little physical contact. So there was more secondary schools actually taken up on badminton um, prior to lockdown, just as an interesting point to note. Um, so again, there's opportunities there uh, wherever there's a threat. So it's just remembering that, you know, there will be a day when, when this is done. So it's a case of seeing maybe is there is there new membership out there and what can you manage in terms of financing and costs um look when, when all is said and done there will be a massive i'd imagine there will be a massive amount of competition for grant funding as well as additional grants being made available for for sport i know fiac will run through some of them in the second half of the presentation but it's a case of having your ducks in a row as the saying goes so ensuring that you have reviewed your previous costs and that you're looking at potential impacts to make as strong a case as possible to obtain funding. And um, also looking at the impact of what your club does, what it brings to a community, what it brings to young people, what it brings to females participating in sport, everything else, and then making a strong case going forward so that you're you're in a strong position then to utilize funding, okay, or to, to gain funding. The must-haves in terms of returning back to play. Obviously, you must have your agreement with your facility provider. Some facility providers um, have asked that clubs have the Sport Ireland COVID-19 officer course done. Um, it's not a prerequisite to do the, the Babington Ireland one. It was a case that we made that training available when there was none uh, coming forward from Sport Ireland. Uh, and thankfully, over 200 people have taken part on the Babington Ireland and, and completed it, the Babington Ireland COVID-19 officer training. So... Uh, I hope everyone has found it worthwhile. In terms of the COVID-19 risk assessment, the template is available on the website as well. And I know that it has been used by a number of other sports as well, so, uh, the indoor sports in terms of, of risk assessing. Um, and again, it is a requirement, you know, that that, that risk assessment is done. Um, and it's, it's in the club's best interest and, uh, and, and as well as our, our own to make sure that we're providing a safe environment, that we've look, looked at the risks and been able to implement a plan outside of that then just to make sure that everything is above board. In terms of COVID-19 officers, we've allowed for clubs to nominate a number of them. It's not a case that there's there's one um, and it's to share the load. There's small pieces that everyone can do in terms of taking the, the load off, off of one volunteer. Adherence to BI guidelines as we've drafted them, they may be changed in terms of what clarifications we get back from Sport Ireland. When we do, they will be communicated out. In terms of club planning, again, what you need, what you can manage. Um, in terms of capacity and everything else, that will all have to be managed. Each club will have their own uh, different issues. And again, if you need help or have questions, 
get in touch with us and we'll, we'll do our best to help you out in terms of contact tracing. The uh, Blockworks app, which Lauren will go through, is another, uh, another resource there for you to, to utilize. And it's quite useful in terms of, in terms of how it's applied uh, when it's applied as best it can be. And affiliated members, making sure that everyone is affiliated. In terms of any non-playing members, uh, they can be affiliated uh, with Lauren. Uh, there's no charge for, for the season. There was previously the five euro charge that's been waived for the season. So if there is any non-playing volunteers that need to be registered and affiliated for helping at the club, please make sure that they're, they're affiliated with Lauren. And as well as that, we'll provide any additional resources as we can. And so throughout, um, but also then it's making sure that you have your physical resources, such as your hand sanitizer, your uh, posters up, that uh, everyone is aware of what the guidelines are and that they're acting in the best interests of everyone taking part. In terms of our resources, there we go. There is just a brief overview. So um, in terms of the return to badminton, uh, we have a, a number of resources available on the COVID-19 section of the website. We also have the um, Blockworks app, which Lauren will go through, as well as the COVID-19 officer training that we developed as well off uh, the back of returning back to sport. So. Uh, there is a number of resources available. If anyone needs needs assistance with any of that, please get in touch. Or if you need any resources additionally that um, that we haven't got, if you need something, um, it's it's worth asking the question, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction if if it's not something that we have, or at least try and develop it. In terms of the overall safeguarding checklist, I suppose just on return to sport. Um, we just have to be mindful this is what's required within our clubs from a safeguarding point of view where you have people under 18 years of age in your club. So all players and volunteers are affiliated to Badminton Ireland. Juvenile club must have at least one safeguarding officer, must have completed the safeguarding level one training, be vetted and be an affiliated member. Uh, the safeguarding officer would sit on the club committee and actively enforce the code of conduct with everyone within the club. A club DLP is assumed by the chair if none can be appointed for the position. As well as that, you have um, the uh, we have the child risk assessment and the child safeguarding statement. And those two pieces are legally required documents. We uh, recently did an audit on clubs in terms of making sure that they have those in place. And also then the have and use a safeguarding officer BI secure email account. So uh, there is a safeguarding officer email account available to all affiliated clubs. And uh, what we'd like to see is more safeguarding officers taken up on them. And um, because from a GDPR point of view and also from a handover point of view, um, we have, um, you know, it's a case, there's also the OneDrive that comes with the account. So any documents or uh, information that needs to be stored, that um, that can be saved there and handed over to the next person. Okay. In terms of my second favourite topic, as fake Andrews would call it, the data protection checklist. Again, it's just making sure that we're managing people's information and people's data as best as we can. Um, so really it's, it's privacy by design in terms of using the, the BI membership system uh, as best as we can, and making sure that there's very little hard copy information left uh, left around the place. And where you have to have hard copy information that you uh, are providing adequate security for it. Okay, so reviewing what information you are taking, what is the purpose for it. Be sure the information you're receiving is accurate and up to date. So just making sure when people are renewing their membership or um, or joining the club for the first time, that the information they're providing you is correct. Only club officers have access to the information that they need. And again, if you need assistance or if you need um, any more information to get in touch with us, uh, particularly in the event of a data breach, that's our responsibility to, um, to manage that. And also then in terms of making sure you don't pass it on to, <clears throat> excuse me, to... Uh, third parties. So we would have had a number of uh, issues over this last while where uh, kit suppliers and things like that have been looking for uh, members' emails and information um, and it's not appropriate to do that without their consent. Okay, so 
um, in, in the best interest of everyone, uh, we'd advise you not to pass on members' data to third parties. Okay, so uh, that is my part of the uh, presentation over. I'll pass over now to Fake, who's going to take you through a number of the supports uh, for member organisations. Uh, thank you, Connor. Connor, can you just share control of the screen? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's always a good sign when we haven't lost any numbers after the GDPR section. So, <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone, um, and thanks for joining us this evening. So, um, my my section tonight uh, is going to be around three areas primarily. So, I am going to discuss. Um, a bit around member organisations uh, and some of our communications on that front over the past 12 months uh, since since we last ran these forums. Uh, I'm going to talk a small bit around uh, grant schemes um, and then I'm also going to touch on uh, the local sports partnership network as a resource to our organisations. Um, so I suppose to get started uh, and to look at the membership to look at the membership communications, which we would have outlined at, at this point last year at the at the for, at the Leinster Forum, which we had in Irish Sports HQ, uh, we would have mapped out our, our plan for communications with each of our various stakeholders. So uh, working right to left there on the screen, from a provincial point of view, we hope to deliver the club forums. Um, and, and thankfully, we're into our third year um, of the forums and, and long may they continue. From a counties and league association point of view, uh, one strategy that we went about targeting over the last 12 months was to develop and build the relationships further between Babington Ireland and the, and the county associations. Um, and we highlighted this uh, as a, an area uh, that we really needed to work on. So between myself and Connor, uh, we undertook the exercise of meeting county and league associations. Uh, initially, it was face-to-face, -face, um, and then unfortunately, as a result of the current situation, uh, a couple of them had to be, had to be, done, throughout, had to be done through Zoom um, and over the phone. So, um, but we gathered a huge amount of information from that, uh, which will inform our practices moving forward, uh, and I'll discuss some of those um, in a slide or two's time. From a club's point of view, uh, this time last season, we outlined that we wanted to undertake a project of calling all clubs uh, over the course of the season. Um, and I suppose this time last year, we were looking at that as a project in terms of getting feedback um, from people working on the ground and volunteering on the ground as to what was working well for our sport and what areas we could improve moving forward. Um, as a result of COVID-19, the content of these club calls did change. Um, and I'll, again, I'll discuss that as we move forward through the slides. Uh, we also conducted a number of surveys um, with clubs over the course of the season, um, and particularly during that COVID uh, lockdown phase one. From a member's point of view, we carried out uh, surveys also. So some of the surveys that we would have sent to the membership based would have included, uh, for example, return to play from COVID. So what people's uh, thoughts and perceptions were about returning to the sport, uh, how, how likely and how quick would they be to get back playing uh, and what were the main factors maybe preventing people from returning to the sport. Um, and then also we would have carried out surveys uh, with new members to the sport. And um, so this was pre-COVID uh, to assess what, uh, I suppose what made um, what made their experience um, worthwhile since they joined the sport. Um, similarly, enough uh, as I've mentioned with, with some of the other surveys, where what areas would enhance their experience? And a very similar survey then was sent to members who had recently left the sport, or members who had left the sport for a year or two's period, um, and then returned. So, um, that was they were they were big exercises to. To delve, I suppose, into more detail. Oh, sorry, to delve into more detail uh, around the club calls exercise. So this is a project which we have now undertaken twice. So phase one of that project was during our initial lockdown, um, and that would have been around May time. And the content of the call, as you'll see there 
on the bottom of the screen. So for the phase one calls, the sort of information we were looking together was around club engagement. And um, so how clubs were engaging with their members uh, throughout the lockdown, uh, COVID support and where I suppose get an idea where Babington Ireland could could help our organisations out uh, throughout the lockdown. Uh, in terms of facilities, um, because f- I suppose facilities is a, is a big one uh, f- for all our organisations, you know, as many would play in community halls and school halls and GAA halls. So, um, you know, facilities can be outside, outside of our control in terms of returning to play. Um, and then also the financial impact um, of the COVID pandemic on, on our, organi- our organisations. Um, what the club calls have looked like in terms of information then in phase two, uh, which we've carried out in, in October of this year. Uh, again, we discussed the financial impact um, and some of the information that came back would have been different this time, um, as I suppose we have a better understanding at further on now down the road uh, of the impact that 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 is, I suppose, uh, <laughs> Sorry, that the, the impact that the, the pandemic is having on clubs and, and their return to sport. Um, there would have been some general queries and uh, we would have discussed restart and registration with clubs. Um, and then as Connor alluded to earlier on in the presentation, uh, we wanted to gauge the interest that members had in terms of return. Um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, as, as Connor said also, uh, there was, it, it, I suppose it was surprising in one sense was that clubs were noting that there was almost a case of higher numbers looking to return. So um, people looking to, looking to get active. So um, that was very positive on, on that side of things. Uh, to give you an idea, the numbers involved in, in this as an exercise. So uh, if we take a look just at the phase one figures there, which are at the top of the screen. So we would have called, uh, the Badminton Ireland team would have called 224 clubs. And this is out a total of 344 nationwide. So that's 65% of our club base. Um, all, call, all clubs would have received the call um, or a follow-up survey, um, with the only exception being uh, if we didn't have the correct contact detail uh, for the clubs. Uh, 65% of the club base, what that caters for is roughly 9,500 members, which is 73% of the membership base. Um, in terms of the October exercise, um, we then hit roughly a figure of 180 plus club calls um, and again, a follow up survey to all clubs and some of those are st- still returning. So we're working our way through, anal- through the analysis of that information um, with a view then to seeing what we need to put into practice on our end as we move forward through these times. Uh, to give a bit more insight then in terms of the county and league visits that myself and uh, Connor uh, would have would have under, would have done um, last season. Uh, really, these were informal discussions that we held uh, with the county and league associations, and they were based around six main topics, which you'll see on the left hand side of the screen there in the graph. So. The topics which were discussed were coaching, development, events, governance, juveniles, and membership. And really, the discussions uh, were just in place to, I suppose, highlight the air the areas for development uh, within counties or what county associations perceived uh, being being them their main areas of development being, um, and also then highlight the strengths um, of each association. Um, what this information, I suppose, it allowed us to take take was an awareness of the support required uh, and how that differed from county to county. Um, and I suppose has given us an idea uh, as well, similarly to the club call exercise of, of where we can implement the, the information gathered to move forward. Uh, the next stage in this process is follow up discussions uh, with county associations again in 2020 and 2021 to maintain those relationships uh, and build on those relationships further um, and also to develop action plans um, around items that were identified as areas for improvement um, and Babington will be working will be working with associations to to help develop any any of those items uh, I suppose just before I move on one example to, to give a practical example 
of how the information has been useful to us so far. Uh, so coaching would have been highlighted as one topic which um, which a number of counties identified as, as needing an area as being a need for an area for development. Um, so with that in mind and using that analysis and the analysis of the of the surveys that were sent out and also the club calls, uh, we applied for a grant through Sport Ireland to develop a new to develop a new coaching program and to implement a new coaching program. Um, and thankfully, we've been successful on that front. Um, and that will be launched in the coming week. So um, that's just an idea of, of I suppose, how, how we've put the information that we've gathered in, into practice. So then to move on to the second main area that I'm going to discuss, and that is around the Sport Ireland uh, Resilience Funding. So uh, we would have made contact with the with member organisations a number of weeks ago um, and would have sent out an expression of interest in terms of a possible resilience fund um, that we were going to apply for True Sport Ireland uh, to del deliver a grant scheme to the club network within Badminton Ireland. So to, I suppose, give you insight as to, to where we are on that front. So we received 103 expressions of interest back uh, from clubs in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and from that, we applied, uh, we applied to Sport Ireland for funding to run a grant scheme. Uh, the announcement came from Sport Ireland last week uh, that we were success successful in our application. Um, so the next step for us now is to open up an application process to the club network. Um, and that will become available uh, within a week or two um, where clubs can apply for funding uh, as opposed to offset some of the losses uh, from COVID. Uh, once that application process is, I suppose, is completed and uh, we reviewed applications after the deadline, member organisations will be notified um, of, uh, of, I suppose, the, the, their application. I don't know what happened there, guys. <laughs> uh, Connor, can you reshare that? Just hang on a second. So, uh, yeah, mem member organisations will be notified um, as to as to the success of their application. But I suppose one thing to consider is because. Uh, we know uh, a lot of clubs have applied through their local sports partnership um, and might receive fun funding on that front. So if a club avails of the funding through the local sports partnership, uh, it cannot avail of the same fund um, through the national governing body. Um, so that's just something to be to be wary of because I, I know a number of clubs have been success successful through their local sports partnership, which is great. So um, just to keep that in mind when the application process does open, uh, if you're one of those clubs who have been successful. These things never pass usually without some, some form of technical difficulty. So apologies there uh, to everyone on, on that. But, um, and then I suppose from a local sports partnership point of view, just to, to tie in as we're discussing them, you know, the local sports partnerships, are a very very valuable resource for for, for clubs um, and they offer a number i suppose they offer a number of different things the, the first thing that they offer is their form of a club directory um, and they can assist in terms of promoting the club um, i suppose one thing to factor in is that all lo local sports partnerships are different in size and in terms of resources that they do have. And um, so I know it does vary from county to county. Um, and I know clubs in different counties have had different experiences uh, with local sports partnerships, but we'd strongly be encouraging all clubs uh, to make contact and put themselves on their local sports partnership club directory. Um, it's good to develop that relationship, particularly then if you're going to go and apply for funding through the local sports partnership it, is that they, is that they're aware of who the main contacts are within your club. Um, in terms of funding, they offer a number of funding opportunities. So similar to Badminton Ireland, uh, the local sports partnership network have had a resilience uh, grant scheme application process, um, which has 
gone out, as I said, and, and a number of clubs have applied to it. Um, so they've, they're have they also delivering on that front. Um, but they also offer small club grants uh, in terms of club development, in terms of coaching, in terms of women in sport um, and, it, and areas like that. So, uh, for example, Carlo Local Sports Partnership at the moment um, have a grant scheme open for their clubs. Um, so not only are they offering the resilience funding, but they're also offering funding for clubs uh, to develop in the areas of club development, coaching, uh, women in sport. So, you know, particularly through these times, and, and Connor mentioned clubs uh, going about upskilling and making themselves so stronger in the current time, you know, a, a possible application there might be around uh, access and funding uh, to, develop, to deliver more training opportunities internally within your club. Um, or maybe a number of clubs link up um, to deliver training opportunities uh, within that within that pod or with that core, um, and then finally they offer volunteer training. So they offer training in the form of first aid online, uh, disability inclusion, and also safeguarding. Now I know Connor um, and the governance section of Badminton Ireland um, have put on a number of safeguarding courses, um, and the uptake has been huge on those. And I, I know Connor will probably discuss those in more details when we get to the upcoming items and um, but just so that you're aware that safeguarding online training um, is provided through the local sports partnership network um, and then before i pass you on to lauren who's going to take you through the blockworks contact tracing app and um, just to highlight some of the events coming up um, from Badminton Ireland side of things. So um, I suppose, look, we're trying to we're trying to remain out there in the public eye and uh, I suppose maintain engagement with our clubs and our members. So uh, what you'll see on our on our social media channels uh, over the course of the next week, next few weeks um, are these weekly schedules of activities. So, for example, this weekly uh, schedule. Uh, would have had the Leinster Club form, obviously, with just tonight. Uh, Safeguarding Level 1, which takes place tomorrow night. Uh, Women in Sport Wednesdays, which has been uh, very successful profiling um, of some of the players, coaches, volunteers um, and admin administrators with it, within our sport. Um, this Thursday, uh, there is a white technique webinar, um, and that is Andy Stewart and... Uh, Coach Education Officer Craig McCourtney, who will be online from 7 p.m. this Thursday, the 12th of November. So uh, registration for, for that is through uh, Eventbrite, and there is a link available um, for anyone who's looking to sign up for that. Um, and then also we're putting on a sports inclusion disability awareness online workshop on Thursday, the 26th of November. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in that. Um, and anyone else who, who is interested uh, can contact Lauren uh, uh, at LAU at BabingtonIreland.com. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren. So then I am now going to hand you over to Lauren, who's going to take you to through the Blockworks contact tracing app from both uh, administrators' point of view and also on a, me a member's point of view. Uh, thanks, Fee. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. So as Fee said, I'm going to take you through the Block Rocks contact tracing app BI has developed for all the clubs. This is for your club to keep records of the attendance in different club nights or sessions. Uh, it is not an actual app, so you can download from the App Store or the Play Store, but you can make the web page as an app icon on your home, uh, home page of your phone. And the step, it's in the menu that Connor has sent you on before the forum. So I'm going to go through the apps in two different point of view. Uh, firstly, from the administrative point of view, we'll go through the member list, uh, adding new members to the list, setting up the training sessions, attendance lock, and then exporting the data. And then the second part I'm going to go through from the member's point of view, uh, we'll go through how to register the session for yourself and to register it for somebody else. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So the name of the app, uh, it's called BlockRock Contact Tracing App. You'll be able to find the link and the QR code on the Fountain Island website. Under the membership section, there's a tab for BlockRock Contact Tracing Apps. And when you go to the home page of the apps, this is what you can see. You will need to put in your login details. 
club secretary have an admin locking details and the rest of the club members will be using a different one. And all the club members are using the same locking details, not uh, individual ones with their individual names on it. So you should have received these details if you have done the club call with one of us. Uh, but if you haven't, you can contact me afterwards and I'll send you on the details by email. So I'm going to demonstrate this with the, my, a, a template club. So I'm the secretary of this club. I'm logging in as a, a club admin username. And when you sign in, this is the home page you'll get to. Uh, all the data is already set up for your club and all the members' names should already be there if they are a member last season. So you can do a quick check here in the members list tab on the left. So when you click into the tab here, uh, you can see all the names here on the right. Um, if you want to go to, if you have more than 10 names, you can click here, click show all, and then a full list of members' names will be um, on here on the right. Uh, if someone is not on the list or is a new member, then you can put in the name here on the left in the members box, uh, members list box. Uh, let's say we have a new member called Alan ABC and you will have to put in his email address and then phone number. Once you hit submit, Alan's name is down here on the right uh, in the database. So the next function we'll move on to is how to set up a training session. If you go back to the home page, you can see here on the right hand side, there's a, la a tab called manage training session. You can click that and then you can see there's a box called training session details. You can basically put in whatever you want. Let's say you're going to have a club night on the 1st of January, 2020. So you can put in uh, 1st of January, 2021, right? Uh, 8 to 10 p.m. club night. Uh, once you hit submit, the session we just uh, set up is down here in the box. So you can set up uh, a few different ones with different sessions uh, so people can register their attendance before they come down to play. So the next thing we can, uh, the next function we move on to is uh, how to register yourself as a secretary to go down to the session. So if you go back to the home page, you can see the middle tab attendance lock. When you click into it, scroll down a little bit, you can see the box here called member's name. If you put in your own name, uh, my name should already should show up here because uh, I'm already in the members list. You choose the session that I want to go to, uh, the 1st of January that we just set up. And then you scroll down and then you have to answer all the COVID related questions and then you hit submit. And then my name is down here for the session, the 1st of January, 2021. Okay, now, so we can move on to the next function, which is to filter and export the attendance lock and see who has registered to come down to the session. So you will have to go back to the attendance lock tab. You scroll down to the bottom. You see this show edit links and data filtering box. You click that box, click the second one, tick to filter and search data. And then all these little boxes will come up. You can search whatever you want. You can search, you can select session and then click the session that you want to see. Let's say I want to see the, the 1st of January session that I just set up. So you can see that my name is down there because we just registered myself into the session. So uh, if you need a record of the attendance, you can do an export by clicking these two boxes here as well. So that is for the admin site. And now I'll switch the account to the member site. If you have any questions, you can type into the Q&A session. So now I'm locking in as a club member. You can see that it's a generic one for all the club members, not an individual one with their own names. 
Uh, after they log in, their page is very simple. All they can do is register themselves to the session or to do it for someone else. So they have to click into the attendance lock tab. Let's say Mary is a, is a club member and she logs in. She wants to sign in to the session that we have just set up the 1st of January. All she needs to do is start to uh, type her name here in this box, Mary, and choose the right name, of course, and then click the session that she wants to go to. And then she will have to do the same thing, answer the four questions. And then once she hits submit, her name will be down here, register for the session. Okay. Um, so the next thing we can do is to, uh, you can do it for, Mary can do it for somebody else as well. Let's say Mary has a teammate, uh, Feek. Feek wants to go to the session as well, but he is not able to register himself online before the session. Then Mary can do it for him. Um, Mary has to go back to the attendance lock, put in Feek's name. Feek is a member from last season, so his name should pop up here. Select the session that Feek wants to go to. And then she will have to ask Feek all these questions, providing Feek is there with Mary. And then hit submit. And then Feek's name is down here in the, in the table, register for the session as well. Okay, the last thing you can do is to do it for someone not on the list, let's say a new member. So Mary has a friend called Amy. Amy wants to go to the session as well, but she's only new to the club. So Mary has to tell the club secretary about Amy's coming to the session and then she can do it, do the registration for Amy online. She'll have to click into her attendance lock and then select the session that Amy wants to go to, but because Amy is a new member, Amy's name will not show up here in the box. So you will have to scroll down here to the blue box, click to add someone not on the list. And then you will have to put in Amy's name, Amy's phone number, and then answer, uh, ask Amy these questions, providing Amy's there with Mary, and then hit submit. And then Amy's name will be down here, registered for the session. So now if you're the admin, you can go back to the attendance lock and you can uh, filter down the attendance and you'll be able to see the three names we have just put in. Okay, so that's all the functions a member can do. Uh, one thing to make sure is that the secretary should set up the sessions and the players must do that before they come down to play. Uh, club secretary should go through the list before the session and check if anyone has ticked no for any of those questions. Uh, if there's any, they have to be notified that they cannot attend the session. Last thing is you should only un, uh, answer the COVID question for someone else if, the per if that person is right in, uh, in front of you. Um, okay, that's all uh, from the webs. Can... Connor, can you put up the poster template for me, please? So we have created a poster template uh, for all the clubs. You can just put in your club name, uh, login username and password, and you can circulate it to your club members. Uh, yes, that's the, that's the poster template. You can just put in your club name on the top, the members login name, uh, login password, and then you can send it to your club members and tell them to register themselves before they come down to play. And um, so we have sent all those all these talk documents through emails already. But if you haven't received that, it's all on the Badminton Island website under the Block Rock Contact Tracing Apps page in the membership section. Uh, we have also put up a demonstration video and the manual on the page. You can have a look there and follow it step by step. And again, if you haven't received the locking details for the app, you can contact me afterwards and I'll send it on to you through email. So that's all from me. I'll pass it back to you, Connor. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And um, yep, so that is the uh, the contact trace and app. Um, we're at that stage now where we get round to all the questions that have come in. Um, no, Fiek, do you want to start off there? 
Yeah, no problem. Connor always trolls me to difficult questions. <laughs> I'll use them now for just, just, the, just the ones you answered, Fake. Just the ones you answered. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Um, so, yeah, I suppose a couple of questions uh, have come in there uh, and the teams have been similar enough to, to recent weeks on the other club forum. So the first one, uh, there was a question around affiliations um, from Roy. Um, and I suppose, sorry, let me actually read the question so everyone is aware of what it was. So the, the question in terms of the affiliations was, you know, that the deadline is coming up and we're due from the 1st of December um, because it's going to be difficult to, to be back playing before Christmas. Um, and the answer on that front is that the board, uh, the Bampton Ireland board are currently reviewing the affiliations um, and there will be a communication soon to member organisations um, on that front because COVID has thrown up uh, a number of considerations and um, so they're being taken into account at present and there'll be a communication um, in the very near future uh, about affiliations. Um, in terms of some of the other questions, uh, another question uh, that has come up frequently as well is in terms of new, in terms of new members coming down to try the sport um, are they insured uh, on club night? So they are insured uh, through the Babington Ireland insurance waiver forms um, if clubs utilise those and they can be used for a maximum of up to three sessions. Um, so uh, information is available on those waiver forms on the website, um, but also you can make contact with uh, Lauren who can assist you on that front. Um, in terms of... Then there was um, there was a question uh, from Alan, and it was just in relation to um, badminton. I suppose it falling into the category or falling into a similar category um, in terms of other contact indoor sports. Uh, in terms, of, I suppose, of its freedom to operate uh, within the various levels of uh, the Living With COVID plan for sport. Um, so, you know, there was concerns raised, obviously, that some of our, com our competitor sports, are, are particularly those um, outdoor sports, are, are able, I suppose, to continue away with pod training at the moment. Um, while, you know, we, I suppose, we have no room for activity at the moment. Um, now, the answer to that is that... Uh, a number of indoor sports have raised uh, this, I suppose, this item with Sport Ireland and the government um, because we would have felt that the restrictions, at, not only at level five, but even going back to level three and level two, they were quite restrictive. Um, so, you know, at level three for us in Babington, it was uh, singles play only. You know, so quite restrictive. Um, and we have been told that we'll get wording on that from Sport Ireland and the government um, soon enough. So a number of indoor sports have teamed up, I suppose, to raise concerns uh, on that front. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, there was just uh, there, there was a question around uh, level one coaching courses um, taking place uh in a greater spread of counties. And so uh, the coaching team have looked at, I suppose, spreading the net in terms of those coaching courses being delivered uh, in various locations. So uh, level there was a level one course, for example, scheduled in Waterford this, uh, this season, uh, which unfortunately couldn't go ahead um, because there was great interest in it, but unfortunately couldn't go ahead because of, of the pandemic. But that'll be rescheduled. And I know the guys in the coach, the coaching section have have been looking at spreading the net in terms of those coaching courses. Um, there was another question just in terms of would it be possible to share with clubs um, information about when funding opportunities um, arise through the LSP. So it's something that we're very conscious of, I suppose, uh, in the membership development section. Uh, in terms of staying on top of it and getting those communications out to clubs. And um, so we do try our best to, to get those communications out. So, for example, when the LSP grant schemes were being run, uh, we tried to communicate as much as possible around those. Um, and even there with Carlo, uh, local sports, small club grant scheme, 
uh, for development areas uh, that came available there last week, we would have communicated that to the club. So um, we absolutely try our best on that front. So um, just keep an eye out for communications uh, because they, they can be they can be sporadic um, as LSPs run them at different times and stuff like that. Um, and even different times year to year. So it can vary very much. So um, would it be possible? LSPs. Uh, I think that is probably the majority of questions. Uh, oh, sorry, there, there is another question there. Um, it's from Catherine Fick. Uh, can you give ideas as to how BI proposed to run coaching in the county? So you weekdays, weekends, you can local coaches, and will there be a cost? Uh, yeah, so I, I suppose, Catherine, uh, if I'm taking the if we're taking the coach and development program. So what's going to happen on that front is there is going to be an application process um, where there will be, I suppose people will be asked to sign up and there won't do, I suppose, in terms of costing around that program, uh, it's not going to be, I suppose it's not going to be uh, an expensive program as we do want to attract people on, onto the course and, um, and from that point of view, sorry, there's going to be, uh, say, there's going, to, there's going to be a couple of different streams within that program. So uh, there'll be coaches um, who uh, may have be maybe shuttle time qualified already. Um, and we want to help those coaches bridge the gap up to level one um, and help them on that front. Similarly, uh, coaches, similarly, people who might be volunteering and assisting with sessions in clubs who don't have their shuttle time qualifications. Um, and we want to help those coaches bridge the gap, uh, first of all, to becoming a shuttle time uh, qualified coach. And then similarly enough, coaches who currently might be at level one who are trying to bridge the gap to level two. So I suppose the programme very much will focus on areas or that will will help coaches uh, bridge those gaps and it's going to be a, a, a program that is being delivered nationwide for for everyone to apply to for, for everyone to apply for and the hope then obviously is that will go well and we can build on that moving forward into the future and this can become an annual program and um, for us in terms of days and, and stuff like that I suppose we're finalizing details around the program structure itself and uh, what we'd be hoping to do is that initially the program will start up online uh, virtually so you know because we can deliver some elements you know we can deliver the safeguarding and the uh, disability training and, and other stuff like that we can deliver that online you know and we can deliver sort of CPD workshops as well and um, but uh, obviously then we have to wait and see in terms of uh, how the restrictions go moving forward into 2021 so um so we're we're playing that one by year. Um, Connor, do you want to? Come yep, in? I'll I'll give you a break there for a minute, Fee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem. Um, no, a couple of questions there. Roy asked, just uh, can leagues be run under level three? At present, no. Level two is only when leagues or competitions can be run. Though we are looking for further clarification from Sport Ireland on if whether that can be relaxed. Um. Uh, a couple other questions I'd answered there. Does the safeguarding officer need to complete a level two course or is level one enough? Under the BI safeguarding policy, uh, level one is the minimum requirement. Um, but we do recommend that people that those who take up the safeguarding officer position do level two as well. And we're going to be running uh, some level two courses, hopefully, if we gather enough interest in the new year online as well. Um, so similar to the safeguarding level one courses that we've in delivering this last while, we'll be able to deliver safeguarding too as well. A um, couple of other questions there as well. Uh, how long do clubs keep COVID signing info on club nights? And we're recommending 30 days, uh, but obviously if you're using the, blank work, the Blockworks contact trace not then uh, that'll look after a lot of that for you. And that's what we'd recommend for you to do. And a couple of open questions there as well that we just haven't got around to typing in the answers to and we just don't have fast enough fingers for you. Uh, Francis uh, asked one of the levels allows for pods of six for the max of 50 can 50 be in the hall at the one time and is that for the whole night 50 people over the nightly session and um, it was I suppose the way in terms of the pods of six at level two that was with the allowing for 50 people in the hall in total and um, 
provided physical distancing could be maintained. And I suppose that's the key part because you could have halls where you'd fit 50 people in, but it would be a bit of a, a bit of a sandwich. And that's not what we're looking for. Uh, so it was just providing what, what space you had and what you thought your capacity was that you would have be able to operate within the pods of six. Uh, so be that six people to a court or six people uh, to a side of a court, provided you had adequate space in and around it. Um, so that's that's what we were allowing for there. Um, uh, another question, uh, just in terms of why we as club players cannot play, but yet we have players travelling, essential travel to tournaments abroad. And look, it's, it's a fair point. I suppose we're acting within the government guidelines that elite sport is allowed to continue. Um, the high performance national training group are allowed to train under the current guidelines. We're given the exemption to train and to compete uh, under those guidelines. And unfortunately, it doesn't filter down to everybody. Um, I can understand everyone's frustration at not getting out to participate in sport. Um, but unfortunately, that's, that's where we are at the moment. Hopefully, uh, over these next couple of weeks, the situation will improve for us and and things will get relaxed. I, I think as a whole, the badminton community has, has has acted really well, acted within guidelines, asked questions, and and that's all we can ask for. Um, and I suppose, look, um, you, you, you might clarify it as, as unessential travel, but I suppose for, for a high-performance high player, uh, training within the national training group, it's probably not unessential for them. So um, it's, there's, I suppose, two sides to it. Um, Nula, in terms of information regarding playing at different levels, does not seem to be very relevant to juvenile clubs where this is maybe 10 kids per court normally. At what stage can we get back to this or have you advice on how to run sessions with 40 kids on four courts? And again, Nula, look, that's very specific to a club or to a particular situation. And, um, you know, we did do a return to badminton webinar where we looked at different, um, at different ways of trying to manage groups, etc., um, prior to uh, returning to play. Um, so uh, I suppose if you want to drop us an email on that, uh, I can probably give you a bit more detailed help than I can in over two minutes on a, <laughs> on Zoom webinar. Um, but no, it's it's something that we can, we can uh, look, try and help you out with. You know, that's that's as best as we can. Uh, once we get to that stage, I suppose NULA is the best way of looking at it. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, and I suppose the thing with juveniles as well is, look, they, they are still, I suppose, able to to train outdoors. Thankfully, you know, they're not being uh, they're not being totally uh, swashbuckled against in terms of uh, in terms of uh, participating or training. So they are able to do outdoor sports in their pods of fifteen. Uh, so uh, we have to bear that in mind as well. Uh, and hopefully, look, we'll we'll get back indoors in the not too distant future. Um, I think is that most of the questions for you, is it? Uh, yeah, it seems to be the the majority, Connor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, just to bring you up then, just on some of the upcoming upcoming items, we have um, delivered tomorrow night is our third safeguarding level one workshop, and it's been delivered by Karina Brennan. Um, so we're very lucky. Once the four uh, safeguarding workshops that we looked to get up and running. Um, were were advertised were pretty much filled up within a space of a week to ten days. So um uh, so it's it's great to it's great that we had that that interest to to get the qualification done. Obviously it's essential for, for anyone volunteering within their club working with children and young people. Um so uh, again we'll be running the plan is in the new year we'll be able to run some more of these workshops and we will send out an expression of interest form to all the clubs just to see if there is anyone interested within your club. That wishes to do the training it's transferable across sports as well so um, it's it's a valuable resource to have and it's free to all affiliated badminton ireland members uh Fiek has touched on the coach development program uh, which should be launched shortly enough and also the national badminton week you probably have a few more bits of information on that Fiek. um well i, I suppose look, the the main event to to highlight again is the technique webinar um, which is this Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, and registration is required for that, but that will be, uh, that is just the first of hopefully seven bit videos in that series. So, um, it's a good resource, um, to I suppose to avail of at the 
during the current during the current climate um, and then as I mentioned a number of other training opportunities which will which will arise um, in the area of disability inclusion uh, your own safeguard and stuff Connor um, and then there's other, there's a couple of other things in the pipeline which we have not yet had full confirmation on so I'll uh, keep my cards close to my chest <laughs> Man, big. Um, and just as well as that, we have um, there'll be additional governance training and resources being made available over the next couple of weeks as well. So um, it's just all, all, all again, I suppose, in, in that current theme of uh, coming back that bit stronger and, and being prepared and ready for for uh, getting back back out onto courts and, and getting the sport back up and running again. Uh, as in terms of the annual awards night, it has been postponed, and um, so there will be more information on that uh, in due course once there's, I suppose, a bit more clarity on where we are in the world with restrictions and everything else. All right. So, sorry, Connor, just to mention as well in terms of the in terms of the grant scheme, one bit of information that I did leave out for the application in terms of the application process is there will be. And there will be a webinar, hopefully, or a video resource provided uh, around uh, around the scheme and what's involved and some of the key points as well. So just to keep an eye out for for communications on that as well. All right. So that's um that's it from from us. Um, if you have any further questions or. Or anything uh, coming up over this next while, um, please feel free to get in touch with us. Obviously, we'll we're there to to help clubs get back up and running as best we can. And uh, if there's anything we can do in the next couple of weeks to help any clubs out there that need to get a plan in place or uh, a bid together for funding for any of those grants that are coming up with LSPs, um, please feel feel free to get in touch with us, and we'll we'll give you a hand as best as we can. Um, but for us, that's that's it for this evening, and the uh, the forum will be published on uh, the Bampton Ireland YouTube channel as well. So for any clubs out there that or any individuals that might have missed out tonight, uh, they'll get the chance to rewatch it again. All right. So thanks very much, and have a nice evening. <laughs>